Welcome. I'm Dawn Garcia. I'm the director of the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships at Stanford University, and we're so excited to kick off this new speaker series. It's the JSK Community Impact Series. And uh, we have some great people here today to talk with you. Um, looking forward to hearing what they've got to say in conversation. Um, the Community Impact Series is designed to further amplify the work that we are doing with the JSK Community Impact Fellows here at Stanford. And we're highlighting the voices of, of people who are really changing how local news and information is delivered and gathered and uh, expressed. So we're looking forward to a great conversation today. This is exploring approaches to local civic information needs. That's the topic today. So our program selects fellows who are working on everything from press freedom to addressing misinformation and local information needs that are not being met around, really around the world. Um, in this series, you're going to hear from a number of people. This is the first one. Excited to have this today. And I am going to just introduce briefly um, the moderator of this series for today. And then he's going to introduce the rest of the panels. This is Lawrence Caswell. He's one of our JSK Community Impact Fellows. And um, Lawrence is the field coordinator for Cleveland Documenters, which equips residents to better participate in local government and builds community around the exchange of civic knowledge. Uh, Lawrence has a, uh, uh, worked in non-commercial media, a longtime programmer. He's a, he's a great radio guy. He's got, he, he does great music when we're, uh, when we're all together. So, but I'm going to turn it over to Lawrence and let him uh, introduce the rest of the folks and um, welcome. And we're so glad you're here. Thanks, Dawn. I, I really appreciate that. Really happy to be here today. And thanks to all of you for joining us for this very first John S. Knight Community Impact Speaker Series at Stanford University. As Dawn said, I'm Lawrence Caswell, 2022 JSK Community Impact Fellow and Field Coordinator at Cleveland Documenters here in Cleveland, Ohio. As Dawn said, Cleveland Documenters is a collaborative participatory journalism organization really focused on both journalism and community building, working with residents to meet Cleveland's information needs. And that's what we're here to talk about today, how other local collaborative journalism organizations are meeting their information needs. To do that, I am joined by a pretty fantastic panel of guests that I am actually lucky enough to just generally be in community with, independent of this forum. Um, uh, a panel of guests from local uh, collaborative journalism organizations that are doing some really great work. First off, I'd like to introduce Sonam Vashi. She's co-founder and development director of Canopy Atlanta, a community-led nonprofit newsroom telling stories chosen, produced, and presented with local residents. Sanam is also a 2022 John S. Knight Community Impact Fellow at Stanford University. What's happening, my fellow fellow? <laughs> uh, also with us today is Linnell Herndon. She's coordinator of Detroit Documenters at Outlier Media. Like Cleveland Documenters, Detroit Documenters trains and pays Detroit residents to document local government meetings. Before she was coordinator of Detroit Documenters, Linnell was a documenter herself. What's happening, Linnell? How you doing? Good, 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 good. Uh, and lastly today, joining us is Jackie Renzetti. She is civic producer and coordinator of Minneapolis Documenters, a brand spanking new initiative of Pillsbury United Communities, which launched just this last January. So we're like a month and, or, or sorry, three, two months, three months and 17 days, two months and 17 days in. Uh, Jackie's bylines also include the Star Tribune, Minnesota Post, The Current, The Guardian, Al Jazeera, and Business Insider. She's also been a mentor and educator for Report for America, 360 Journalism, and the Journalistic Learning Initiative. Hey, Jackie, how you doing? Hi, thank hey. you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, so um, this is for the audience here. We will be taking your questions for our panelists today. We'll be taking those questions throughout the panel, and you can leave those questions anonymously if you choose via the webinar Q&A section. Uh, again, you can leave those questions throughout the forum, forum and as we see them, uh, uh, we'll pull them pull them out, or I'll pull them out, honestly, to, uh, to ask our panelists here. Uh, we do ask two things about those questions. A, that your questions be in the form of an actual question. It is really helpful. Uh, uh, and B, we ask that your questions be as concise as possible so that we have time to really consider those questions, answer them, and then answer as many other questions as possible. So um, that's great. Uh, look forward to your questions. Look forward to this conversation. I would like to um, start with a question that I have for all of you, but honestly, I'd like to start off with Sonam, if you don't mind, Sonam. Um, tell me a little, about, a little bit about the community that you are focused on um, at Canopy Atlanta and, and a little bit about the 
information needs of that community. And I say community, but I acknowledge Atlanta's a big place. So maybe we're talking about communities instead of a single community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much, uh, Lawrence. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and be in community with everyone here. Community is a word I feel like we're going to use a lot today. <laughs> So uh, as Lauren said, I'm with Canopy Atlanta. We are a nonprofit newsroom that launched in 2020 that serves uh, Metro Atlanta, the five county Metro Atlanta region. Um, and within that region, we really focus on communities that have been underserved by local media. And we define that in a way that's really specific, including communities of color, including low wealth or lower uh, economic opportunity communities including um, areas that just have never had responsive news coverage and areas with lower civic participation rates is something that we've actually looked at uh, really recently. And so we're really looking at faces that fit the intersection of those areas. And that's a really wide variety of places. So our first program that we do, which is called Community Issues, actually takes a neighborhood-based, place-based approach at looking at information needs because we could you know, collect you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of responses from this like region of more than 10 million people, but we really wanted to do like a targeted defined like responsive, I think that's a, it's a really important as responsive way of, of, of really talking about what does this community really need and how are they shaped in ways that may be similar to other places but are also really specific to them. So we started in a community called West End in Southwest Atlanta, also a community that actually I'm really, uh, I live right next to, and, uh, and multiple people on our, on our staff did, and our team did. And um, what we did is we just start, you know, we start our entire process, everything we do by listening. And so we invest quite a bit in, of resources and time and um, just, you know, emotions and relationship building into just get, being out in the community, being, talking to people, um, working with uh, community members that we you know, eventually may serve on a community editorial board to reach others as well and build trust in a slow process. And so what we hear from specific communities may differ from each other, but what we really hear that might be um, you know, across multiple communities, we've done this three times now in three different areas, are just you know, uh, frustration sometimes at the lack of response of different whether they're public or private or nonprofit agencies to what community members actually need, which is why we really uh, center that process. And we also hear things across the gamut that I'm sure are happening in other cities as well from housing insecurity, from uh, issues around food access. It's a really big one that we hear a lot about. Uh, issues around um, government transparency in some cases. Uh, that's been really, you know, different based on where we are. Atlanta is a really balkanized area. So that's, you know, we have a lot of different municipalities in some cases where we're talking about the metro region. And so that's something that's varied from community to community. But I'll stop there and kind of let, uh, we're really, really interested to hear what Jackie and Linnell have found as well. Absolutely. Yeah, Thanks, Lana. I have to say, like, I'm really interested in, in a, um, this sort of pull between, like, trying to address the sort of like information needs that sort of go across a region or across your coverage area while at the same time trying to like listen to individuals and neighborhoods and communities I mean like in some ways like we talk about it like it's all the same thing like let's interact with our let's let's learn more from these communities and do what they want but honestly doing that if any larger than a, than a neighborhood is going to sort of pull you in different regions particularly we're all from organizations that, that have limited capacity I mean you know and, and I say limited to really mean like limited, limited capacity. Like it's just a few people. Uh, I have more to ask you about that, Sonam, but be before we do that, I wanna pose this question next to Linnell. Linnell, could you tell me a little bit about the community that Detroit Documenters is focused on and about the information needs of that community? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad Sonam went first because all that, right? Um, um, so Detroit Documenters started in 2018 with like a community organization, Citizen Detroit, but since have moved to outlier media. So first I have to definitely shout out the organization that houses us in Detroit, um, Outliers Community Service Based Journalism, and we couldn't be a better fit. Um, so I'll definitely talk about that more, but like Outlier has already identified a lot of the community needs in Detroit and has set up like a process where there's like a tech system. So same, some of the same things, housing, utilities, um, 
I'm drawing a blank right now, but like all the classic stuff, transportation issues, you can text, you know, um, Detroit to, I forgot the number, sorry guys, but like, um, and you'll have our journalists actually literally like Sarah, the founder of Outlier Media and some more staff are the ones who are manning those text messages, reading through them and responding back to people. So like, it's definitely, very personalized and community-based. So for Detroit Documenters, which is another program out of Outlier, of course, um, we cover all the government meetings, the local government meetings. And um, by sending everyday Detroiters to these meetings, training them, showing them how to cover these meetings, what they're even talking about in these meetings, and then how to report it back to their communities is probably my favorite thing about Documenters. Um, um, we say that it's, you know, underreported news, but it's the most important news. And really what we're doing is empowering our residents to be the news. And they're the ones who are reporting the news. They're going to these meetings and finding out firsthand what the discussion is before it's even an ordinance, before it's even a law, right? Um, and so we're just kind of guiding the news in that way, like, what do we want to know? And what are we finding out? Like not the synthesized notes that come out of the minutes and, and the things that the government may or may not put out on their websites, right? But like consistently going and telling you in our voices, like what we're hearing, what we're seeing. And so I think that's super empowering. Thanks, Linnell. I, I, there's mm -hmm. like, as I'm sitting listening to you talk, I, I'm a, I'm, I, I feel a number of questions sort of coming out of me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I wanna move on next to, to Jackie and ask the same question to Jackie before I jump on into anything else. Jackie, tell me a little bit about the community that uh, that Minneapolis documenters is focused on and about the information needs of that community. Sure. <clears throat> so our like host organization is Pillsbury United Communities. Um, it's 140 year 140 years old. Um, it's a nonprofit. And our mission is to co-create a just society where every person has um, economic, social, and personal power. So we try to apply the same like mission to documenters. Uh, Pillsbury historically is always focused like very similar to Canopy and in Detroit, just focusing on like immigrants, um, working class um, within that like families and um, communities of color. Um, and so we have four brick and mortar centers in neighborhoods that are predominantly um, people of color. I guess specifically, I'll just mention like we have um, predominantly like Native American and Hispanic neighborhoods and a Somali neighborhood and a predominantly black neighborhood. So those are kind of the demographics that we're keeping in mind. And um, so with documenters, we, um, I guess what I'll say is that we are still in the process of maybe determining more specific information needs. Um, that's something we're excited to use this program for. We're hoping to do some surveys to really kind of hash that out more. Um, but there's definitely, we know there's a hunger for accountability. Um, there always has been for a long time, um, but especially in the wake of the police killing of George Floyd, um, we really saw this program as just another way to build community power. And there's definitely been a more, I don't know, like it's always been there, of course, but like definitely, I would say like living here over the past several years, there's been like a more pronounced effort, I think, on using public records, which is cool to see, you know? And so it's great to have this program coming at that time when there's already kind of a renewed interest in like, you know, Minneapolis Police Department records and stuff like that. So yeah, I'll say that, oh yes, the top three topics that I've heard from documenters that are interested in covering are, um, public safety, um, housing, and uh, like land use and development. So that's kind of what we see as information needs, I guess, so far. That's kind of like the hunger that's there. And I think those are really important topics, but um, I can't, I don't have like any survey results to cite for like specifically where the gaps are, but we're working on that. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, it's one of the interesting things for me working at Cleveland Documenters is the, 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 the effect of actually hearing that input from documenters, like the questions they ask, um, the questions they asked about about government, and I just when we talked before, and you mentioned the the murder of George Floyd and and how that's making you sort of think differently about covering government. It just, I guess, I, I feel like there's so many things that that are similar between our cities, but also it's just always interesting to me 
the things that folks are asking about. And like some of those things are things that like, hey, this is news. Like we have a consent decree over the police department here in Cleveland. And we just passed a new um, a new ballot initiative to really change how uh, police accountability works. But at the same time, folks are asking about basic stuff like what what's up with the water bills? Like, you know, like it's just it's really it's interesting to me, like how the sort of relationship between basic things and like things that are sort of more news that folks want answers to. And uh, they're, they're not always the same. Um, I want to sort of pause for a minute uh, because I feel like, well, two things, A, both Jackie and Linnell, I mean, obviously the three of us are all in a documentaries program and all of our documentaries programs have have uh, um, home institutions, uh, have institutions that sort of house the documentaries program. In Detroit, it's Outlier. Uh, in Minneapolis, it's Pillsbury United Communities. Uh, uh, and here in Cleveland, it's Neighborhood Connections and the Neighbor Up Network, which is a neighborhood granting, neighborhood co community building organization. And I've, and I've sort of heard from, from both of you, and I feel the same way, that um, uh, that documenters and our sort of house organizations are, are just a really good fit. I also feel like they're all very different um, organizations. But because we've heard a little bit about, about, about our organizations, I'm sort of curious, Sonam, could you talk a little bit about how Canopy Atlanta like was formed, like how you how it came together, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, we, we don't have documentaries. We have, uh, but we still uh, have a participatory journalism focus. And so what we did is um, we were really inspired by the work that was being done across the country, uh, City Bureau, Outlier here, you know, now like all, all these amazing groups that are starting documenters programs. But, you know, basically a, a group of journalists came together in 2019, just knowing that things needed to change in Atlanta, that there were information gaps that were not being addressed. And most importantly, that we were just felt like really disconnected from the communities that we purported to serve. And, you know, I'm from Atlanta, I'm from Metro Atlanta, like, I have been writing about the communities I come from, but it was mostly for, you know, particularly like um, higher income, you know, majority white serving publications. And I, I really felt this, um, this, this, this uh, difficulty with that, you know, it, it, it felt extractive in some ways, which like, you know, it, it's strange to say that because I'm, I'm, you know, from these communities. And like, I think there was, there's a real, that disconnect was, was really difficult for a lot of us, I think. And so, you know, what we decided was that we needed to reconnect journalism to the communities. And the best way to do that is to center, invite, equip them in, this, in the process of producing that journalism. And so what we, we have done, you know, especially through our community issues is that we trained residents in the communities that we are focused on, the place-based, you know, uh, uh, you know, focus areas that we may have. And we train, you know, their community media makers, there may be your uh, neighborhood association secretary, maybe they're just, you know, someone who's interested in uh, their community connected to it, has an interest in storytelling or reporting. And we tr pay and train them to do journalism that responds to those information needs that we're collecting in collaboration with experienced journalists. And what we found is that even though the stories, the series of stories that we publish out of that process are really important, they're filling information needs, they're, they're contributing to the larger ecosystem of Metro Atlanta, it is that process through which we're seeing this really intense impact where now we see, um, you know, we've seen everything from former fellows who are now, you know, photographing for the New York Times and other national publications, and it, which is amazing, but that's not our um, intention all the time, right? It's that also that like we see, uh, other fellows who are like equipped and equipping others to work on resident-led solutions. You know, we talked about food access earlier. We've seen people who've participated in some of our programs, like working now to address that because the energy, the convening, like the process of doing that reporting or being involved in, in just uh, a community of, of people working to, to, you know, think about these things. Uh, we've seen the sort of generation that 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 creates and it's been really exciting to redefine what we want our outcomes to be that way as well uh, i think it's really interesting particularly coming from um from cleveland and really neighborhood connections which sees itself as a community building or organization that like i mean for for us there's so much um of because of because we're associated with the neighborhood connections we really come out of that community network building ethos that the sort of notion of holding space um for other folks to come in grab something and build what they want not to say hey come in here and give us this information or build in this direction 
uh, I, it's like really a, um, that notion is really uh, crucial for us. But it's sort of interesting to hear you guys come to it from the from the other side, from the journalism side. Like I wonder if if documentaries had started in Cleveland, but with another organization, if we would be thinking of it that way. Um, that's interesting. Uh, anyway, a little a little break here. You are for those folks who have just uh, jumped in. You are watching a John S. Knight Community Impact Series Forum Speaker Series Forum at Stanford University. I'm Lawrence Daniel Caswell, Field Coordinator for Cleveland Documents and uh, JSK 2022 Community Impact Fellow at Stanford University. I am joined here today for this conversation about uh, um, about a, uh, local approaches to collaborative journalism and information needs with Sonam Vashi of Canopy Atlanta, Linnell Herndon of Detroit Documenters, and Jackie Renzetti of Minneapolis Documenters. If you have a question, uh, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A section of Zoom here, and we'll get to it as we, uh, as we go. Just two quick reminders about any questions that you drop. Please have your questions be actually in the form of a question. And uh, two, uh, please have your questions be as concise as possible. A uh, really great question here from an attendee here that I will um, will hear. Could you all share how your programs collaborate with local or regional publishing partners? So honestly, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to answer this and then I'll toss it uh, for myself and then I'll toss it to somebody else. I'll say at uh, in Cleveland, we have been very, very cautious and intentional about the partnerships we have participated in. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, we're a really small team, uh, and I think all of us have been in experiences where we've been stoked to partner with another organization, and then because of the whether lack of planning or lack of alignment of priorities, um, the work on that partnership ends up being really imbalanced or well beyond what anybody uh, planned. Um, the other piece of that, I, I think, for us about being cautious about partnerships is that we've also been in situations where folks um, have um, particularly journalism outlets have come to groups that are more community focused and that relationship between the journalism outlet and the community group feels extractive like the folks from that outlet are just there to get what they need for their stories from the community and so to protect our community our documenters from that we've been really purposeful uh, um, we really only have a couple of partnerships that we've participated in one with a, um, a local community um, news outlet called the Cleveland Observer uh, another one with a non-commercial community uh, radio station called WOVU, and everything else is really like very direct one-on-one, -on -one, nothing bigger, although I do feel like some some bigger things uh, are coming. But Linnell, I'd like to pose that question to you. Maybe you could talk, because I, 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 one of the things I'll say about the documentaries program is that even though all of these programs are sort of, um, and that Sonam is, is the, the egg, to be clear, Canopy Atlanta does not have a documentaries program. Uh, um, but for Jackie uh, uh, and Linnell, each program is really different. I mean, you sort of get the the platform and the sort of background and all this information from City Bureau, but when we're able to sort of run it the way that we want. So, Linnell, I'm curious about the the approach to partnerships that you have taken in in Detroit at Detroit Documentaries. Yeah, so perfect because that's the last thing about Outlier that I didn't mention yet. Um, very instrumental in collaborating with other media partners. So Outlier actually has several media partners um, and I think probably also strategic in how they bring them on. Um, they had some when I got there and then we've added more since I've been there. And so I can say that, you know, we do also think about who we're adding, how and why, and what they can bring to the table as well. But like, we run that by all of our partners. Like, would you would you be cool working with Detroit Free Press, with WDT? These are our media partners. Planet Detroit, Detour Detroit, which actually just joined the Outlier team. So just makes it even stronger, right? Like, um, these are all people who recognize the value of the service that we do and are here for the collaboration, right? And so I feel like Detroit Documenters is really in the center of it all um, here in Detroit because all of the reporters for all of these different um, publishing companies have told us, like, we value your service so much. There's no way we could cover all those government meetings. And to be honest, there's not even any, we can't even cover them all. Um, but so that's part of what I'm really realizing is the power of Detroit Documenters is like the network that you build as well. Um, and so what we're really pushing now in Detroit, like in, in Minneapolis, they're like, you know, they're infants. And here we're just kind of like toddlers, right? So we're just really just getting started, believe me. Um, but we're just letting you know, like if you've ever been a documenter and now you're kind of doing other things, we love that. 
and you're still part of the documenters network and you're still part of our community and just like imagine what it would look like with well right now we have 300 trained documenters right um so even if you're not actively taking assignments and getting paid by outlier for what you do, you know how to do it. So we've had documenters go ahead and live tweet meetings on their own. Totally the goal. That's what we want you to do. Um, I don't even remember the question. I just get so excited talking about <laughs> talking about documenters and all the different relationships. Like I'm super excited to learn more about Canopy Atlanta because we cover a lot of government meetings um, and um, report on that, but we definitely want to move into the community spaces, right? Like some of these block club meetings and local organizing meetings and just see what those people have to say. But I mean, we do concentrate on public comment um, as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you're not the only one uh, who would like to talk more. I mean, I obviously I, I've spoken with Sonam a good amount, but I feel like in so many ways for for where Cleveland Documenters is at, I feel like Canopy is doing things that we want to be doing. So yeah. I just feel like it's just like I'm glad we're all. I mean, we're here talking in front of all these folks who are here for this uh, webinar. But like, like vice versa too, vice versa. <laughs> yeah, yeah I just to, to be really clear with everyone watching, we would totally be sitting here for this hour talking with each other about all of these things anyway, and probably will be. Uh, a lot more over the next few <laughs> months, I think, which uh, honestly also sounds like a, a really good time. Um, uh, Jackie, I, I have a question of, for you. I, I just keep thinking about, like, you're only like a couple months into this. And I think part of this thing that's interesting to me is talking to all of us who are really at different sort of like stages in, in, in our programs or our organization's path. Uh, but I am really curious about how you have thought about um, which what to cover, like what meetings? Uh, I, I know that we were we spent a lot of time, probably more time than we should have spent thinking about what meetings to cover ahead of time. And we ended up focusing on city council. I mean, not exclusively, but but largely just because we thought it was like a thing we can get our hands around and the meetings were available uh, uh, on a semi regular basis. Uh, but I'm curious uh, as as you were starting, like what, what were you thinking about focusing on meeting wise? Yeah, that's that's a great question. That's something that I thought about a lot. And I was like worried about it. Like I was like, how do I make sure that we're doing this right? But it ended up being easier than I thought for a couple of reasons. Um, I guess the first one being that we did really intentionally, you know, before like committing to any priorities, we waited until we had like our trainings with the documenters, or at least our, our first training with our first group of documenters to kind of hear what they had to say and that helped shape things. Um, and I have like a survey, like a little interest form that every, that most, that people fill out, like if they want to be a documenter. So I use that survey too. And so that's how I found like the three main topics that are, um, housing, public safety and policing and like development, land use, et cetera. Um, and I was worried, I guess I do a lot of math, like early on, like it just became easier with time as I got a better sense of like the rhythm of these meetings. Um, and just becoming more familiar, I guess, with the calendars. We, we didn't actually have to skip that much, which was what I was worried about. Um, but I think a lot about like personal capacity and also like our budget. But right now we're able to do pretty much every Minneapolis meeting. So like any city government meeting and the advisory boards. And we also do Henneman County board meetings. We have like, we're, we're trying to slowly add some advisory group meetings, but right now it's mostly just Henneman County board. And then we do school board. So that's about 50 meetings a month. And it it works out. Like I think, I don't know, it just does. <laughs> it just um it, it that yeah. Um, so yes, that's what we cover. Um, I try to make sure that like within that, that we're not this hasn't happened yet, but I guess I just in my head, I like try to prioritize like the three main topics, but there's never been a moment yet where like I have to eliminate or choose between anything. But yeah, that's so it. that's that's what we're looking at. Um, hopefully, you know, if we like right now, it's like literally just me yeah, <laughs> with yeah. the documenters program. Um, I have a great uh, boss. She might be out there watching. <laughs> she's amazing. Um, she's there for like support. She's you know, she has she's like the head of like narrative at Pillsbury. So like mm -hmm. she's has some oversight, but I'm the one kind of doing most of like the, you know, the editing and the training. So if we get another person, you know, eventually down the road, we can expand more maybe, but Yep. Yes, that's where we are. 
Uh, that's re really interesting and interesting to me that you got that you really try to talk with documenters and did your trainings before you figured out what you were going to focus on. Like, I think we did that. We did that differently. But at the same time, like after once we started having meetings and documenters started having feedback, I feel like we sort of shut down us um, us making decisions about what we were going to cover and really let documenters like um, lead us with their curiosity. Which now that I think about it, I think I actually, well, actually, well, here, um, I was going to go to a couple more of my questions, but we have more questions here from the chat. Uh, once again, you are watching a uh, John S. Knight Community Impact Speaker Series Forum at Stanford University here on Zoom. I'm your moderator, Lawrence Daniel Caswell, a 2022 JSK Community Impact Fellow. We have a question here from Lindsay. What kind of feedback have y'all been getting from residents about the way you are presenting information? Online stories versus printed info versus texting, for instance. And and how does that shape what you do? I, honestly, I'd like to toss that question to Linnell first, and then and then to Sana. Linnell. Well, that's interesting. Um, I guess I have a few things to say about that. We get great feedback from um, people who read. Uh, documenters in Detroit, we put out a newsletter every week, which kind of synthesizes the notes that we've taken or the meetings that we've covered that week. And we put it into super plain language. First, mm -hmm. we try to figure it out. And then we, we let you know what's going on, which is also what I love about documenters. Um, I think some of the things that we're thinking about moving into um is using our partnerships more for like radio spots um coming up with some visual things just so that we can reach all different kinds of learners right everybody doesn't read the news a lot of people like to click play on stuff nowadays so we just want to be as accessible as possible not only in the delivery but also i like what you were saying jackie about like asking your documenters what do they want to cover that is so important and um that's our community too. And what I love about documentaries, well, clearly it's everything, but um, I mean, it's just so perfect. But like, when you're talking about reaching these communities, these underserved, underrepresented communities, documenters are coming from those communities, right? Um, and in Detroit, we're 85% Black, but but guess what? Our documenters are, that's not the only way to measure diversity, right? So our documenters are from all over Detroit and outside of Detroit, not far but in the area, <laughs> um, but they're all ages. They're all um, levels of sophistication and experience as far as journalism. We want to hear from everybody, you know what I mean? So just trying to get the things that we need to give them the resources to do their job um, is what's most important. So everything's pretty much written right now um, in different formats, whether it's notes, whether it's, in a newsletter, whether it's a post that we put out, but we're definitely trying to move into some more audio visuals for the community as well. Thanks, Lamel. Uh, Son, same question to you. What sort of feedback have you guys been getting from residents about the way you're presenting information? Yeah, I, you know, I just want to like reemphasize something that I think you know, Lamel was saying as well, which is like I think by centering and inviting the people that you serve that you want to be like reading this information that need this information and want it like in the process like it's so much easier to meet people where they're at I mean like you you hear that phrase all the time like, especially in like engagement journalism but like I mean you know it, this idea of like I think that that is like driven, you know, a lot of my philosophy personally in Canopy Atlanta in some ways of like journalism being in this ivory tower where we're just delivering information in this way that like only college educated, you know, journalists will read Twitter. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> which I'm super guilty of to be clear, but like, you know, I deliver and get a lot of my information on Twitter where all the other journalists are. Guess what? No one cares about Twitter. <laughs> I mean, some people do, but you know what I mean? It's just like, it's so silly. And so I think by like, opening it up right opening up like who gets to do this work who should be doing this work which is like the people that's what journalism used to be and like I think then you start to hear like oh yeah like people listen to radio people you know <laughs> or like you know talk radio or um you know for us like what one thing that we've we've been really really thoughtful about this because not only are we like so place based we have to be like really specific about like where people are at like and also we launched during the pandemic which like I mean, when we, were, when we were doing our listening work and then this later guided our like sharing out and delivery, like 
you know, people were still afraid of touching the mail, you know, like we didn't know how COVID was transmitted. And so we really had to think about like how to reach people. And one thing that we did is West End, the first community that we were focused on is like a front porch community. There's a lot of older homes and just everyone's out on the front porch on a nice evening. And that's where we were too. We just like went porch to porch canvassing that way. And then, you know, someone had asked earlier about uh, partnerships and, and how we like partner with other media. I mean, that's that's a huge driver of delivery. Like you have to partner with people who are already doing this work. And I don't think any of our, any, any work that is being discussed today is intended to like subsume all the content in uh, our respective areas, right? It's about like adding this hugely crucial, like missing pieces to the local news ecosystem. And then like figuring out ways, okay, great. We're going to be focused on Bankhead right now. Who's serving Bankhead, whether it's a media organization or a community group, or like, how do we get, how do we partner to meet people where they're at that way? And so that's kind of the way that we think about it. That's, that's interesting. All this conversation just has me thinking about where, where we're at in Cleveland um, with this question about, I mean, because the, for the most part, we've been doing this for a little over a year uh, now, documenting public meetings with, with, you know, meeting notes and tweets. And we have a few stories. Uh, we have a weekly public meetings report, but for the most part, it's text. Um, but at the same time, we know that Cleveland has a relatively high illiterate, functional illiteracy rate. Uh, by functional illiteracy, we really mean like essentially like fourth grade or below reading level. Uh, and that for folks, you know, younger than younger than my age at 47, um, podcast listening is really high. So I, I think we're thinking, thinking a lot about how can we do what we're doing in ways that are not that are not text, uh, um, that are audio. Um, but of course, you can think about it all you want. Um, but you're not producing a radio show unless you have capacity to produce a radio show, which is another issue. So to some extent, we're planning. Um, another question from on an attendee here in the Q&A, and once again, you are watching a John S. Knight Community Impact Speaker Series Forum uh, here at Stanford University. Uh, another question here for our panelists, what's your favorite local impact story? Uh, and, and honestly, I, I will, I'm going to toss that to Jackie. Jackie? Um, sure. So we are just a couple months in, but I, I guess one that I have so far, um, so how do I explain this? Um, okay, so we started like in January, right? But we had some of our documenters, like some of our very first assignments that we made available for documenters to sign up to do were older meetings that happened like throughout the fall. And these were redistricting meetings for like drawing the boundaries for city council and um, park board districts. So we had people go back to like the beginning of the process for like that, group and that process continued. It's so like, we, we found like what we missed. And then as the process continued through January and February, we continued to cover that. And we were able to take all of the notes from like 10 different people um, and compile, you know, like a little guide, just like, okay, here's where we're at. Here's what's next, you know, like before two big public hearings came up. And that was just like, I was just so grateful to be able to use a tool like that. Like, there's no way, like, I, as a report, you know, like one person was not going to be able to go through all of those meetings and like do something like that. Like it was really a collaborative effort. Um, so that's probably my favorite local impact story so far. That's great. Thanks, Jackie. What about you, Linnell? Um, Jackie stole my favorite story. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but totally similar. Um, I think it is just the news reporting that comes out of documenters notes and realizing how important documenters notes really are. Um, so recently we've had um, our reporters credit, not just the documenters program, but our documenters by name. And I even asked one of them like, what made you do that? And he's like, I was citing my source. And I think that's just so perfect, right? Yeah, totally. Um, so I just think, yeah, that's probably my favorite. Uh, I'm going to, Sonam, I have the same question for you. Uh, what's your favorite local impact story? But I also just want to just throw a little, not maybe not a dig, but uh, what I, we would love it if uh, um, more folks that we know are reading our documenters' notes and live tweets uh, credit them as we ask them to do um, for the record. So anyway, Sonam, what's your favorite local impact story? I think, I think that's a great um, example of what you were talking earlier, Lawrence, of extractive partnerships, like something to be really 
mindful of is the, that power dynamic. Very interesting. Uh, our, you know, ours, the one that's coming to mind for me right now is um, also kind of uh, like, like the core functions of government related. So, um, you know, I, I said earlier, Atlanta obviously is this big city in, in the South and, you know, we cover Metro Atlanta and for a variety of reasons that I will not get into today that have to do with systemic stuff. Uh, we have a lot of little cities and municipalities dotted all around Atlanta. Um, that we also serve. And so our second community issue, a series of stories that we produced, uh, was on a city called Forest Park, which is just outside city limits, it's just south of Atlanta. And um, it's, real, it's a really small city that has no regular, you know, very little regular news coverage. There's one outlet called the Clayton Crescent that just started trying to do more regular stuff, but very little accountability. And what we heard from residents when we did our listening work there, we talked to 100 It was, was over and over again, what is government doing? You know, what is like, there are all these boards, there's all this stuff, they don't communicate to us, we just don't know what's happening. And so uh, we had one of our fellows, we trained a cohort of four residents as our journalism fellows to, to report these stories out. And one of them, Ann Pellegrin, um, who is a longtime Forest Park resident, started looking at the city budget, because that had just uh, come out and was just kind of like, just looking at it. And what she found is, uh, just by doing the math and looking at like the year over year increases, she saw a really shocking discrepancy where there was like a 90,000 increase in this like very, you know, I don't even know what the category was. That's how like, you know, uh, uh, archaic or, 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 or just like a very complex, like, you know, audit category that was that had increased so much. And so she started asking questions about it. And what she found is that it was just a mistake. It should have just increased by like $900, not 90,000 or something like that. And it wasn't an intentionally like, you know, it, it wasn't like a nefarious wrongdoing that we could see in any way. And I think what, what we saw is that like, if, if you know, I as a reporter had come to Forest Park and saw that discrepancy and had written a story saying, bad job, Forest Park, you stole money from the taxpayers, which, you know, this is a serious problem to have that kind of discrepancy, that would have gone one way. But by having a resident find this, ask the questions of city government, and then government being like, oh, that's our, that's our bad, we'll fix it now. It just became this like completely different, like useful, productive process that like, wouldn't have happened otherwise too. So I, I just thought that was like such a great example of what participatory journalism does. That's, that's so or, interesting. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Can I follow up? Cause I feel oh, like shout out to Noah if he's watching my partner here in Detroit. I feel like he might beat me up if I don't mention it. Same exact thing. Once again, like Sonam was saying, like when you start seeing the government do different things, that's how you know you're having an impact, right? So like, I'm not saying it was completely the fire that Detroit documenters put the city clerk under, right? But we weren't getting minutes published from, our, from the city council hearings. And we wrote about that a few times in a few places, right? Like, um, Detroit Free Press is our media partner. So we dropped an op-ed and we put a, published it in our own newsletter. And I mean, now um, the city council has amazing records of the super clickable, useful calendar with all types of links. And that's all we want to see, right? So it's like that engagement. And I think being virtual helped a lot too. Being on Twitter, like I remember when I first started documenting, and I was just like, "Oh, that's cute. This weird girl in the back of her laptop taking notes. That's real cute." But now you're like realizing, "Oh, that's a Detroit documenter. Oh, they're documenting and they're live tweeting and they're sharing it." And you know, we've had people add us back, um, which whether it's for like a discrepancy, right? Like Sonam was talking about or not, it's interaction. And it's the ability for not only them to know that we're watching and we're gonna hold you accountable, but for them to be like, oh, yo, my bad, let me fix it. This is what it is. Or I learned a whole lot about the water company and how the water bill works. Like I had been pulling my hair out. I'm, I'm a rather sophisticated, educated person, and I could not figure it out. So you're not going to tell me that there's residents in Detroit who knew what's going on. I'm telling you, the people who work at the water company didn't know what was going on. You know what I mean? And so that 
abil- that ability to interact at that higher level and be like, we're watching and we want to know. And, and it's, it might be a little bit of a challenge, but it's also an opportunity and presenting it that way. It's just helpful for everybody, right? Now the water company knows how to run itself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, I guess I want to say like, that's part of what I think is so cool about documentaries. It's like, it's not just like participatory among like residents. It's, I mean, like there is a dynamic, right? Like we're not, we're not trying to be like friends with the government, but we are trying to take a more like collaborative, like, you know, like opposite of like traditional journals and mindset, like a non-combative way. And that's something that I really appreciate about the programs in other cities as somebody just starting. And that's something that we're trying to start here. Um, I just wanted to mention that. I just think that's a really cool point. It's, it's honestly, it's one of my favorite things. And, and I, I, something that I think I was surprised by, uh, by how quickly, just like the, the effect that a little sunlight has on local government. I mean, these are meetings that for the most part, if you're not involved, if you're not on that particular body, if you don't have to report to that body, if you're not a specific reporter who's not there to report on the whole meeting, but really is just there to like report on a detail about a story, nobody is going to those meetings. And, and, I, and it was really interesting for us. We didn't know one of our biggest concerns uh, uh, as we started off was that the that these meetings would be, uh, how do I want to say, not uh, friendly to documenters. Uh, and and while I, and I have to say, like in, in the um, the year and a quarter or so that we've been doing this, there's only been a, a couple of like rare instances of something negative happening. Uh, what surprised me is the the amount that I will listen to someone in city council say, "Hey, like we actually we have documenters in the room, so why don't we pause and actually explain that a little bit better?" Or like something happens at a meeting and a documenter points it out on Twitter, and then they fix it. Like it was, it was wrong. Like it wouldn't have happened before. But like a documenter, a, a resident actually says something on Twitter in that in a documenter's thread, and they're like, "Oh yeah, that was our bad. We'll fix that." Like totally. And not that every every interaction with local government has been uh, um, like friendly. I and mean, there's been a couple of contentious ones, but by far, um, I just like I'm struck by just like our presence in the room and our like stating our presence um, changes how these meetings are run which effectively changes how local government is run. I think that's that's super interesting uh, uh, and, and like fascinating. Uh, uh, it's awesome that it's happening in, in all these places. I have another question here. It's about 248, I should say, that you are watching a John S. Knight Community in- Impact Speaker Series at Stanford University. Today we're talking about um, local approaches uh, to information needs by local collaborative journalism organizations. I'm sitting here talking with Sonam Vashi of Canopy Atlanta, Jackie Renzetti of Minneapolis Documenters, and Linnell Herndon of Detroit Documenters. I'm Lawrence Daniel Caswell of Cleveland Documenters, also a 2022 JSK Community Impact Fellow. One more question here, just a few minutes left in this forum today. Uh, and it's a, it's kind of a, I mean, it's a great question, but I, I will say as someone uh, in, in my position, in the same position that we are, we are all in, it's a difficult one to answer. How do you measure community impact? Um, I sort of feel like I'm, I almost feel like I'm tossing a grenade to somebody. Uh, so, so because I, I probably know you best on them, I'm going to toss that question to you. How does Canopy Atlanta measure community impact? Actually, I'm really excited to talk about this because it's something we've been thinking a lot about. So I'll, I will grab the grenade with both hands. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I feel like um, this, is a, this is an oversimplification, but I feel like in journalism, the way we've defined impact is like generally in two buckets. One is like, did a lot of people read this or listen to this or view this, right? And that's clicks, uh, you know, that's clickbait in some cases. How big is your audience? How, is, how big is their open rate? All that stuff. I don't think it's not important. That has obviously driven a lot of really bad decision making in our industry and maybe gotten us to the place that we are in today. So the second way that is incredibly useful and um, important is like, did this change a lot? Did this make a person in power, decision maker, lose their job, make that kind of like big, big, you know, systemic change? And for an organization like ours, like we're not trying to do either of those. If we changed a lot, which I think will eventually happen, awesome. Like that's that's huge. We, that's not, you know, 
something that we're not interested in, but that's not like the basis of what we're doing. What we're actually seeing, and I said this, alluded to this before, right, is like what we are literally producing, the products, the newsletters, the stories is really useful and is filling mm -hmm. information gaps, but it is the process where we're seeing the impact, is the process of inviting and you know equipping and centering that we're seeing increases in trust and information. You know, you want to talk about misinformation, disinformation, like that is, that is in my, you know, in our experience, inviting people and centering them in this process is what bring, builds trust in information and journalism, right? Because they see how the sausage gets made. They see that it's, they're, it's accountable to them and to us. And so I, I think, that is where we're seeing that kind of impact as well as you know when we think about the change that we want to see in our communities whether it is changing a lot or what have you is again that convening of like what happens when you get people in the same room when you get them when you get you know uh fellow Anne Pellegrin to talk to the city council government versus journalist Sonavashi I think that is the kind of impact we're looking at and that we're really excited to, and we have like some really interesting ways of tracking that over time and measuring that, that we're really excited to build more. Great, thanks Anna. Um, same question for Linnell, how do you, how do you measure community impact uh, at Detroit Documenters? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, it was kind of what I spoke about before, right? By seeing a change in the government, by seeing a change in your community and your neighborhoods, like, and for the better, for the more transparent, for the more accessible. But then also exactly what Sonam was saying, like, for me, what I'm really learning and realizing is like, it's the power of this network and it's empowering people, right? So if you, we've trained 300 documenters, we don't have 300 people taking assignments, certainly not every week, but just imagine, you know what I mean? As we keep growing, how many people are empowered and know that they can go into these meetings, that they can even go to these meetings and they're allowed to be there, that they can ask these questions if they want to, that they have that right, that they have the right to get the information, to get these documents from the government and we can show them how, right? So a lot of it is the trainings that we do. Like last night, we just did a parliamentary procedure training. What are these people even talking about in these meetings, right? Like, what does this mean? And we need to know it so that we can go back and tell our communities what's going on, what's what's going to happen. So for me, it's the empowering part um, and the education part that we're giving everyday citizens to hold their government accountable and just like what they'll do with this information now, you know? So I think it's, it's in the future that we'll see the impact really. And I think it's coming actually sooner than we think. Also, one more thing real quick. Um, Outlier has a, a freelance journalist network as well, right? And you can get into that through documenters or just having another way. That's just another way that like, even I've done it where I've seen an issue in the community and I've come to them and be like, Ayo, hey, this is going on. They're like, oh, run that story. Or if they're not gonna run it, oh, I have a media partner who might be interested in this story. And so that's a story straight from the residents' mouths, right? Like coming to you, like we're, we're telling you what the news is. That's great, Manel. Thank you, Jackie. I know I know it's early on for you, and I mean, and I'll and I'm I'm going to ask you the same question about how do you measure community impact, but with full acknowledgement that like us, even like a year and a quarter in, I'm still like I don't I know how to do and I know what's important, but I know don't know how to how to put it on on like on paper yet or in a spreadsheet, which I guess is where it belongs. But but how are you thinking about measuring community impact anyway? So like in your early stages. Yeah, I guess. I guess like our goals, I don't know how to say this. Like I, um, I'm learning. Okay. So to back up a second, I, um, I think the network is just like so crucial for these programs success. So like, luckily I'm coming in as like the fourth program. I can learn from the other three cities. So with that in mind, you know, like I've, you know, read a lot from like city bros, um, you know, like research and, you know, philosophy on this, like, I guess I, I pretty much agree with everything like that's been said, like, I can't say what they are yet, but those are our goals, like same goals. Like we are also hoping to, you know, see how many documenters come to these trainings, like, like to highlight like what a, a part of what Linnell was saying that I thought was cool was um, like, it doesn't really matter. Like, it's not so much like how many people are participating each week. It's like over time, 
how many people the program is like touching kind of um like somebody could come to a training and like maybe they're not the most active documenter but that's like totally fine like the program is supposed to be flexible it's supposed to be like come do what you can when you can um so <laughs> yeah sorry um I guess no, no, just, no, no. Like, we're looking at impact in terms of more much more like qualitative wait yes qualitative versus quantitative much more <laughs> like building relationships especially when it comes to like media like you were saying like we are taking that slow um yes I guess I'll just end there <laughs> just yeah. looking at building relationships to boost information that, that makes a, a whole lot of sense and honestly Jackie like I said we're like we're yeah. really like not that we're in sort of the similar minds about like I know what's important but I don't know how to think about uh, I don't know how to think about putting that down yet and I, I also yet in yet another case I feel like I'm about to have a really long uh, like two hour conversation with Sonam about me metrics and measuring impact at, in, in our future, probably in the next 45 days. Well, um, I, I, just, I feel like what Jackie just said about qualitative versus mm -hmm. quantitative is so important. And like, it is not like we've not figured it out and it is not easy, but like, I, yeah, I, I just think that is such an important thing to highlight. Yeah, I agree. And then like when it comes to the logistics of tracking impact, like we have an impact tracker. Mm -hmm. So we input these things like what note session was it? And then maybe, I mean, it might be really empty for a long time, right? Because we don't know, but we feel like this could have a potential for impact and we can go back and fill it in later. So it kind of makes it easier for us to track. So maybe there'll be a meeting. We'll have that down later on. We'll see a, a news article come out of it. We'll put that down later on. Something else will come out of that news article and we'll put that down and then that just helps us later when we have to like get money right <laughs> yep yeah, that's great well folks we are getting close to the end and i have uh, one more question from the q a oh sorry i've turned off my audio hoping it will be a, a just short answer only so we can try to get it done in this last little bit what's one simple thing local governments can do to make their info more accessible to community members just one thing uh Linnell, go Oh man, um, publish the notes and put up a recording of the meeting. Please, Sonam. I'll add and say, and listen to your community members to figure out how they need to get it. Sweet, Jackie? Just having like a, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to make it a short answer. <laughs> Just having your website be easy to find. Like it should not take a bunch of steps. I'm trying to like not sound mad. No, 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 you can sound mad. I'm a, I'm gonna go on mine and I'm gonna sound mad because I am mad about it. How about if you have meetings that are legally supposed to be public meetings and you're legally supposed to have agendas and minutes posted, you post those meetings, you say when the, where those meetings happen, you post agendas and you post minutes. That would be sweet, city of Cleveland. Anyway, you have been watching a JSK Community Impact Speaker Series panel here uh, um, or talking about uh, access to um, access to um, sorry um, let me rephrase this you've been listening to a JSK community impact speaker series forum where we're exploring local approaches to uh, uh, accessing community information uh, uh, I'm Lawrence Daniel Caswell a, a 2022 JSK community impact fellow and field coordinator from Cleveland Documenters joining me today for this great conversation. Thank you all. Sonam Vashi from Canopy Atlanta, Jackie Ranzetti of uh, Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis uh, Documenters, and Linnell Herndon of Detroit Documenters. Thank you all for joining me here on what is uh, honestly my 47th birthday. It was a really nice way to spend an hour with y'all, and I hope to spend more time with you in the future. Thanks for all the questions, and thanks for everybody for uh, joining us today. This will be available, a uh, video of this panel will be available later. Look uh, to the JSK website, particularly the JSK Twitter, for links to that. Uh, and I'm going to toss it back to Dawn. Dawn, thanks for having us today. Well, happy birthday, Lawrence. First of all, we didn't know that. That was a fantastic conversation. Learned so much from all of you doing great work in your cities, for your communities, with your communities. That's the important thing. And thank you again, Lawrence. Thank you, Sonam. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Linnell. Thank you, Alberto, for uh, organizing this. And we look forward to future sessions and having you all back again uh, with JSK. So have a great day.